thread all the way through Scripture, and it points to what God's going to do with humanity. So when we sit here and we, and we hear these words, I want us to make sure we're not putting ourselves in some sort of a box, thinking, oh, we got to live within the, in a covenant-type box or inside of a box of um, dispensationalism, but we live, or, or in any other type of form of quote-unquote denominational thought. Because again, go, go back to um, Ecclesiastes. Solomon was so wise, he said something that was very clear. There's nothing new underneath the sun. And when you really stop and think about it, there is books and books and commentaries and everything else that are written about our scriptures, even Jewish commentaries about the, um, to mold the, the, the Hebrew Bibles. And, you know, all these things are good. And then people, you know, it's kind of like finding. And it's kind of like, oh, wow. You know, God, God's Spirit has shown this to me, and they write this stuff down, and they go in and share it. And that's perfectly fine, because that's all what a pastor does. That's all what a teacher does. That's, you know, we, God shares to us, and we should be sharing with others what God's sharing with us. But there's not one single truth in certain topics. Is there is a truth that God's Word is true. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And so instead of getting sometimes caught up in denominational um, controversies, we ought to just sit there and look and listen and try to understand why do the Methodists believe what they believe? Why do the Baptists believe what they believe? Why do the, Pres the Presbyterians believe what they believe? Or the Pentecostals believe what they believe? And understand that everybody's seeing these things because we've got a mind that God's created, but it's very limited compared to the mind that God has. And so we're, we're in a constant mode of learning about God. Now, that learning has to stay true to the bedrock, and that's Scripture. You know, when people take Scripture and deviate from it, and we have this in the Mormons, we have this in the Jehovah Witness, we have this in a lot of different cults that have come out and started off being, hey, yeah, I believe in God, and then all of a sudden what happens is they believe in God, but then they start looking at Scripture. And because in their mind frame, they'll sit there and they'll look at things and they try to put God in a box. And they try to fit God into something that only makes sense to them. And then they teach which, what makes sense to them. And we limit the knowledge of God. Because now we're looking at it, it's called a paradigm. You know, if you look at a horse, a racing horse, when a racing horse, they put blinders on a racing horse they create a paradigm view. So that horse is only seeing one thing. What's ahead of him? He can't see his peripheral vision because that blind is stopping peripheral vision. So he's living, he's working inside of a box. Well, what happens a lot of times, religions, denominations, especially within Christianity, we they work with inside of a confined box. And they think everything has to fit within that confined box. But God's bigger than a box. When Solomon wanted to, when David wanted to build a temple, and, and God said, "No, you're not going to build a temple. It's going to be your son Solomon." And Solomon builds a temple. God says to Solomon, "says Look, yes, I'm going to bless this temple, but I ain't living in this temple. I have the whole universe. You know, I can't be just in a, in, a, in a temple. God is bigger than a temple. God is bigger than our world. God is bigger than our universe, our known universe of everything that we can see." And I love the Hubble, the Hubble telescope. I'm a big uh, um, space fan. I grew up in Florida. I love all that stuff. But I realized all that's done to me is just prove how big and mighty and powerful our God is. And when David writes in Psalms and says, where do I go that I can hide from you? I can go to the depths. I can go to the furthest galaxies. I cannot escape your presence. That's how big our God is. And when we can kind of somewhat can see that, then we begin to open our minds and say, hey, God, you teach me what I want, what I need to hear. And so all this is being said because I don't want, you know, again, it's not to offend anybody that's, that studies a lot about covenantism or studies a lot about dispensationalism. All these things are good, you know. But the problem is, is that sometimes if we put ourselves in a box, we end up making an idol out of what we believe instead of actually believing in God. And God doesn't want us to make idols over certain topics. He wants us to be available and, and open to hear His truth through His Holy Spirit. That is 
set in stone through scripture. So, like the Mormons, they have what they call um, the Book of the Covenants. Um, and it's like, they believe that God continues to speak. And so they'll add into these additional book, all these new revelations from God. You know, the Bible's Bible, but there's got to be additional. And, you know, no, no. Bible's the Bible, period. You know, now, there's, and I won't give you names, there's been prophets. And if you, and honestly, true, if you lived in the Old Testament days, they'd be stoned and dead by now. But there was prophets here that called themselves prophets in the United States, and they would say, hey, the coronavirus is going to end on Easter. God's going to do something miraculous. Well, here we are on May the 5th. We still got the coronavirus. What happened? You know, those type of people are the people that you need to watch out for. Because it's just like when people, um, and, and some of us that are older may remember, um, um, what was it, Henry Wiseman or something like that? He, back in 1988, he wrote a little book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Come Back on September 8th, 1988. Well, here we are in 2020, and Jesus didn't come back. But what happened? Scripture says, you no one knows the day or the hour of the time. Not even Jesus was kind of, as a different topic altogether, but blows your way, blows you away. Not even Jesus, as a man in, on, on earth at the time, knew the day and time. So you sit there and you say, well, wait a minute, you're God. I mean, you know, it, it, that's the part that I don't fully understand. But it does, I do understand that, hey, when Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, that means no one's going to know the day or the hour. You know, so as, as George has pointed out, this whole Canova thing has been, yes, another birth pain of something that's coming up. And we need to look at that. And we need to be cautious of it. And we need to be aware of it. But at the same time, we don't need to be fearful of it, as we've talked about. In the, you know, in fact, you know, and you're right. There's so many. Bill, you said something. There's so many people that are afraid of this. God doesn't want us to be afraid. God doesn't want us to be afraid of a virus. If I, if, I, I love, um, and, I, and this is not meant to be sound racist, but I love um, Stonewall Jackson. And, and there, was a book, there was a movie called Gods and Generals that TNT actually put out. And, um, and I guess it's based upon a book. But I watch movies. I don't read books a whole lot, except for commentaries and stuff like that. But um, in um, Gods and Generals in the movie, and I really kind of thought it was funny, but TNT is the one that put this out. But um, Stonewall Jackson says, the guy walked up and said, why? He, he led an army into battle. People were getting shot over. He got shot in the hand. And then one of his um, younger, or um, lower rank commanders comes up and says, you just walk in. You're like a stone wall. He says, why? And his line in the movie, and, I'm, and, and I read it and I looked it up, and this guy was a firm believer. But I, that's a whole different story as far as how you can be a firm believer in God and still think what you're doing is right. But he was a firm believer, and he said, and, but his line was in the movie, he says, I feel like this is what God's called me to do. If God tells me, if God allows me to die, then I die. I have no choice over that decision. But I'm going to continue to do what I feel like God's telling me to do. And I thought that was such a powerful line for our whole lives. Because when you really sit and think, if, we're, if we live our lives thinking that, hey, if I get this virus and I die from it, okay. It's part of God's plan. I'm not going to sit there. Now, I'm not going to put myself and walk up to the edge of the cliff and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to jump off. You know, are you going to save me? You know, it's just like the, the temptation of Jesus. But at the same time, I don't want to live my life in fear of dying someday. Because I have no choice of that. I can do my best to take care of my body, which I don't do take good, good, good care of it. But, you know, I can do things to take care of my life and, pro, and, 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 and healthy things. But bottom line is, and if my day comes, God knows that day is going to come. It's not me. So I don't need to live in fear of something that's going to happen. Because God knows that. And when God says, Marty, it's time to come home, trust me, I'm going to go, yes! Do I wish to die right away? No. And I love there, there's a verse, in, in, and I'll get started. I'm going on from, I don't know. Remember that statement that the guy made on the uh, video we watched a few weeks ago about fear? Remember that? 
Yeah, that's right. But there's a verse. There's a verse in Philippians that's been one of my favorite little verses, and it says, "For me to live is Christ, to die is a gain." And that was Paul's, you know, letter to the Philippians. He says, "You look, my whole life is going to be to live for Christ, and when I die, I gain heaven. I gain more than I ever dreamed of." And when we begin to look at things like that, and that's where, and and and, and to bring this rabbit back to our topic. That's where Paul, Noah was at. Noah was a man who followed God's commands. He was the only one righteous. Now, you have to understand when we get into this. doesn't mean that, that Noah was sin free. And we're going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that his sons were sin free. Because we're going to find, we're going to read into this pretty soon. But especially around Ham and Cana. But, you know, the thing is, is that God saw Noah being righteous. And that, and that Noah would listen to God and follow through his commands. And because Noah did this, his family was saved through the flood. Very similar to how Christ takes care of us. He was redeemed through the flood, as Peter writes. And, you know, and his family survived through that. Now what's getting ready to, as we see is we're going to see the human side of Noah. And we're going to see that sin didn't stop. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that's where, you know, just as the, as the video said, God makes a covenant with Noah, knowing, and he says it clearly, that man's going to continue to sin. But I'm making this covenant, as we're going to get into, he says, I'm going to make this covenant that I'm not going to destroy the earth with a flood again. So that's, you know, I want to kind of get that out. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, chapter 9. Now, it starts off with verse 1, and I hope I, I really do want to get through the chapter 9, but this is a powerful little chapter. God blesses Noah and his sons, and he says to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And you see this again also in verse 7. Now this goes back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. So if you don't mind, go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and read it, and tell me, you tell me, what's the difference between these two commands? Because he goes, to, he goes to, to Adam and he says, I want you to do this. And it includes be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But there's something different between that command there in Genesis and this command here to Moses, to um, Noah. These are made in God's image. Okay, he's made in God's image, boy, but keep, keep going. Okay. Dominate the earth. All right. So read read that verse. Go ahead and read it out. It says, and rule over, dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. Okay. So let's stop and think here. Okay. God tells, um, read the whole verse. It's, uh, this is 28. And God blessed them, granting them certain authority, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and sub sub subject it. Put it under your power and rule over to dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. Okay, well, and that goes to the next point we're going to talk about here in a few verses. But again, the difference between the two was yes, God wants us to. Be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth. Now, Jordan, if you listen to the, if you listen to, and I love how these things something fit together. If you listen to Jordan's sermon Sunday, what was what was the thing that God really wanted that the husband and wife to do? Multiply. Yeah, to multiply and do what though? Not just multiply, but to raise kids. Yeah, right, right. To raise kids. Next generation. The next generation into loving God. That's why this, this new song that's come out from Elevation Worship is called The Blessing. And I don't know if you, in our church have sung it several times, and there was something really neat that happened in Orlando where there was like 80 some churches. And they all sang the song together on, on YouTube and it showed each of these little worship pastors or, or singers from different churches singing this same song all at the same time. 
And it was really kind of cool. But it, it comes out of numbers where, where it was a blessing. And then, and then it talk, in that song, it talks about not only to me, but to my children, to my children for a thousand generations. You know, God's, you know, God's plan was the earth to be multiplied. But it wasn't for multiplied to, to go into sin. It was to worship God. It was to be fruitful. And he gave Adam and Eve a very unique command that they broke. And that, bro that, that broken command not to eat of the tree end up causing the whole earth still today being punished by sin. And we saw that in Romans as we studied the Romans when, when Cliff was teaching. But you got to understand, in here you're not seeing also to have dominion and subdue because guess what? They, when they died, when they sinned against God, Adam and Eve, wow. they lost that ability to be in full control. So Paul writes, and Jesus um, says it, you know, right, you know, writes through John says, "Who's in control right now of the earth?" Well, God's overall in control, but who has more dominion right now on the earth? Satan. Yeah. Satan. Right. So you sit there and you say, "Hey," and Jesus, he breaks that that chains that that you know that confinement that Satan and sin has in our lives by dying on the cross. But you know, when Adam and Eve, when they broke the command that God asked them to, to break, they put ourselves into a place where they, you know, they don't have the complete dominion and authority that they had when they first started. When they first started, everything was perfect. There was no sin. So the command was, yes, I am creating you, man, both man and woman, I'm creating you. I want you to multiply, to fill the earth, to rule and to domain or to, to have dominion over top of this creation. This is your planet. You know? And so we I have no idea what that would look like if they didn't if they didn't eat the forbidden fruit. But they ate the forbidden fruit, and all of a sudden now they became a slave instead of being one that has the rule. In the dominion over creation, they subject themselves to sin, to Satan, so that he, in a sense, has the dominion and rule over top of us. So, you know, when you when you sit there and you look at it, what happens is it says, like in Ephesians, that, the, that death and the devil were, were in control, but, that, but God, through Jesus Christ, breaks that control. You know, and so, and again, throughout other parts of Scripture, we have a new life in Christ. Not that we're ever going to get to the place that we was in the garden right now, because we're still sinful creatures. But but our sins being washed away through the blood of Christ, and so that's the difference that you see between the two. So you, as it starts off, God gives Noah and his sons the same command that He gave to Adam and Eve. Except what was different between these two commands is that you don't see the word subdue and dominion because God knows. They can't subdue and have dominion over something they have because there's sin already. God punished the earth because of what the, of how sin continued to gross over to where there was only one person that was righteous. Out of all that, and, and, and again, I, I, this blows me away. I, I hope it's blowing you away also. But think about all these people all the way through. And not only did they have one son that carried the lineage all the way, but they had multiple sons. So we're talking about Noah's cousins. We're talking about Noah's um, other family members. They all died in this flood because they gave up on trusting God. It was only Noah who was still a righteous person that God saved through the flood. And so here's this. Now, now, now you'll begin to see how this corruption happens because at the time when when Adam was created, what was the command that God gave to Adam to do before Eve? Name all the animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, how do you name animals if they're afraid of you? You know, so there was a relationship between all of God's creation. And so there wasn't this fear of, of, of man and animals. And there wasn't this prey or predator that animals had a fear of man. No, no, we got the we got the hunters. 
you know, and the turkeys. I've seen the turkeys on Facebook pages and stuff like that. You know, we got we, we got this thing. But guess what? Before that, if you was living before the sin and everything, you wouldn't be hunting those animals. Because what did God say? And you just read it. Um, Oh, Duh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what was he supplying for food? Fruits and vegetables. Oh, right. and Everything. Uh, but it wasn't meat. It was covenant that we were commanded to actually eat the animals. Yeah, we, and, that's what, and that's where it's, things have changed. Because now they're walking out of the ark. And we're going to see, well, there's not a whole lot of vegetation growing yet. Now, yes, there was a dove that came back with a, with a leaf of, a, of an olive branch. All the vegetation by the time they exit the earth, or exit, I mean, exit the ark, the vegetation hadn't grown yet. And so, you know, there was, they needed to survive. You know, and so we're going to see here. So the fear, he says this in verse 2, he says, The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird in the sky and within everything that creeps on the ground. And all the fish of the sea, into your hands they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give you all as I gave the green plants. Okay? As I gave the green plants, it goes back to Adam and Eve. But now God's opening the door, and he's saying that once this relationship, because you got to sit there and think, there was lions and bears and all kinds of animals that today, you know, Today, a lion, you know, let's put it this way. A crocodile in America, no, I'm not talking about alligators, in the Nile alligators. I'm talking about crocodiles. You, you, I, I'm born in Florida. You can walk up to a crocodile and it will run from you. It won't come near you. It wants to leave. You know, there's that fear. I come up to its nest, it's going to protect its nest. But most times, most snakes, most animals will, will run away from you instead of attack you. Now, yeah, there's some animals, a cottonmouth water moccasin. Trust me, I would I, we'd be swinging off a cypress tree, laying into a river, and next thing you know, a cottonmouth water moccasin would be chasing us instead of running away. It's like, okay, don't know if the nest was nearby or what, but they were coming after you, you know. A... Um, I've heard of stories where like the Nile crocodiles or the crocodile, the, the alligators um, in, the, in Africa, they'll chase after you for the most part. You know, they go for food. And those guys, they eat wildebeest. I've got a video I'll show you, to show you sometime of, of an alligator eating a, a wildebeest. And a wildebeest is like the size of a horse mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Grizzlies, I, you know, I never, I never hunted up in the Montana area and stuff like that. I hear grizzlies normally will chase after you. You know, a black bear, they'll run away from you most of the time. Again, if they're protecting their cubs or, 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 your, or something like that, you know, there, there's a mother instinct that comes in these animals. But majority of the time, when you look at animals, they fear us. Where did that fear come from? Here it is. Now the fear and terror of you on every beast on the earth, every bird in the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish in the seas, into your hands I've given them. Every moving thing that, sh that is alive shall be your food for you, and I give it all to you as I give them green plants. Now, you don't see here, only eat clean animals. You know, those rules are going to come down later on, and again, that's, you know, as I've mentioned before, a lot of the laws that were given to Moses and to the Israelites was to help them separate themselves out of 400 years of being confined and living in a very pagan society. And so the laws that, that God gave to the Israelites were to use to help separate themselves and their customs and everything else that they've been living with for 400 years. And to break them away from worshiping moon and stars and cats and everything else. To just worshiping the one true God. Only you should eat, okay, verse 4. Only you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I require your lifeblood for every beast that I will require, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require that life of man. Whoever sheds a man's blood, by his blood shall be shed. 
for in the image of God he made man. So before we go into verse 7, what does this mean? What, what, what is God trying to teach us through this? Don't kill anybody. Well, it's, it, okay, don't kill, don't kill another man because God's going to hold you accountable for that. We kill in return. But killing animals. He said we could kill animals for food, but he says here, don't eat the flesh or don't eat the blood. Mine says uh, you can't use the, the life blood, can't eat the life blood in there. Right. So why? What's the purpose? Why is God, I mean, you know, I don't, is there anybody eats rare steaks? Mm -hmm. I'm not a big, big fan of just eating rare steak again, I guess because I read this scripture and I see that, I see that blood in a sense in rare steaks, but you know. I think it's more about cannibalism. Yeah, cannibalism. Eating some, eating some that's alive. All right. Guys on the, on the Zoom, why is God so adamant about not eating the blood of animals? For the separation points between men and animals. Okay. Can you continue on with that thought. Was it because it was used in sacrifice? Okay. We're going. Yep. You're. You're. you're which, was that James that spoke? Yeah. No, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on what you were saying. No, I, I was just, I was just throwing a, a point out there. That's one of the, the separation points between men and animals. Uh, you, you know, with the life bullet, or you know, uh, not necessarily the. Uh, raw flesh or raw meat for that that perspective but it's a different uh method i guess or a different purpose or different again just a separation between man and animal uh, again for our own uh, well, i can't think of how it, how i would put it in any different than that okay so i look up hebrews 9 22 And read it. And you're right, Jay. I mean, you're right, I mean, and you're right also. I mean, it is a separate treatment between man and animal because God, God says here, He says, "I'll require the life of the animals that kill man's blood." But you know, that can kill man. But um, there's something specific, especially around blood, and I want us to make sure we don't lose this point. Uh, you say Hebrew nine twenty two? Yeah. Okay. You want me to read it or you got it? Yeah, go ahead, please. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed of blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay. So the Hebrew, God's speaking to the writer of Hebrews, who's writing to the book of Hebrews, and he tells him, and you look at this, and you see this, the blood of animals was used as part of our atonement in the Old Testament days. Okay, so again, Keep in mind, God. What chapter and verse was that in Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. God, who sees all things, you know, he's seen what blood represents. Mm -hmm. He knows that the blood of his son is going to be used to save the world. You know, up until Christ being that true sacrificial lamb, that unblemished lamb, but up until that point, it was through the blood of certain animals that used for an atonement. So God's seeing the full picture here. There's something more to just blood, not eating the blood of something. You know, we're not talking about, hey, we, you know, it's separating, you know, yes, it's separating us from man, from animals, and everything else, but there's a more symbolic meaning to the blood to God that he's trying to get across more than just, hey, you know, I want to separate you and I don't want you to eat your blood. Because again, you know, he, God sees his full picture about what blood represents. He uses the blood of, of lambs and, and of animals for atonement. His son's blood is what washes away the sins of the world. You know, so God's seen his full picture of blood, and he doesn't want us to use the blood in a very disgraceful way than what, than what he sees again. He's putting some honor and respect around the blood of both animals and around man. 
Because God, again, sees the full picture while we're looking at it and we're hearing these commands. Noah's hearing this. Up until this point in time, he didn't kill animals for food. Were animals killed before the flood? Yeah, in sacrifices they were. Yeah. But they didn't eat them. Right. No. You know? Mine says there's no greater symbol of life than blood. Right. Without a blood in, a, in, a, in an animal, it's not alive. Right. Blood. It's the lifeness of, of, of God. God breathes, and we saw this. He's, he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy everyone that had the breath of God, that had the breath of life within them. That breath comes from God. The blood has come from God. And we see, and we see, and we see this uniqueness about blood that God's trying to portray through this again because He's starting with Noah, and later on we're going to see now the requirements of that blood from animals and how it will atone for the sins of the people down the road. Hmm. I never thought that before. Any comments before I go on? Any questions? But I do have a question about Hebrew nine. Okay. I was looking at it in a different. Uh, I was looking at it in the New King James, and it said, and, and there it said, in accordance to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without, and without shedding the blood, there is no remission. It's just now talking the future of like Jesus on the cross. Yes. So Jesus, Jesus died once and for all. There was not a need for any more sacrifices because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. But, it, but just as the blood of the animals in the Old Testament days served as, a, you know, as an atonement for that forgiveness of sins, now Christ's blood on the cross died once and for all, for all. So there's not, and even today, the Jews don't sacrifice anymore. Now, I, I, never, I mean, Paul, you may, I may need you to kind of chime in on this because I really don't know this, the, the answer behind this, but why do the Jews not sacrifice anymore today? Is it because they don't have a temple or what? Uh, number one, they don't have a temple to sacrifice it. It was destroyed. It was destroyed. Okay. Number two, the Levitical priest line that had to do the sacrifices is gone. Okay. Are you a Levitical priest? Yep. They right. do have some sacrifices in uh, some Jewish tribes in uh, Africa, but they're not by the book official sacrifices. Okay, understood. Hmm. I thought about that with the temple being destroyed. Yeah, right. well, I, I, that's what I thought. That's what I was thought. I mean, I didn't really put it. Two, two together, but that did, that's what I had in my mind was because there was not a temple. But uh, but you're right also about the Levitical priest line, which makes me ponder another thought. But I'm not going to chase that rabbit right now because I know I would do it. Um, so again, so verse seven. As for you, and again, he goes back into this. I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and populate the earth abundantly, multiplying it. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons, and uh, to him saying, Behold. I myself will do will, stat, will do establish a, my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, the wild, the wild living creatures, um, every beast on the earth with you, all that come out of the ark, every, even every beast of the earth. I will establish my covenant. And again, I want you, you know, that was the reason kind of for showing that little video up front. A covenant is, a, is an agreement that God makes. Now, one thing you'll learn, and you, and you probably know this by now, God has never broken any of his covenants. Period. You know, God sets up a covenant. He will not destroy the earth by water again, period. Will the earth be destroyed again? So, and Peter writes, he says, yes, it will be through fire. You read Revelation, you'll find out it gets very hot, there's a lot of different, um, it's almost like the plagues of um, Egypt that God brings upon the earth, and there's going to be a major destruction upon the, the, the surface of the earth. But it will not be through flood. But God's making this, this agreement with all of humanity. And, and as, as the uh, Bible Project put out, and it was interesting, this has no condition. 
It's not like, okay, I'm going to do the flood, and I promise not to flood the earth only if you do this. This covenant here has nothing to do with what man does. In fact, we'll see this in a minute because he know, God, God knows a man's going to continue to sin. But he makes a covenant. He says, I establish my covenant with you. And he says, this will be the sign of my covenant. Verse 12. Which I am making between you, uh, me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I will set my bow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So, question. Up until this point in time, did anybody ever seen a rainbow before? Mm -hmm. Why? Never seen the rain. Yeah. Right. And never right. seen rain. Now, science teaches us how is a rainbow created? From the moisture. From the moisture. Particle. Okay. It's a reflection. It's a reflection. It's like a prism. Yeah. Prism. And so, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Through the refraction of light in a prism. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, you know, again, God's not doing some mystical thing. God uses the elements and the laws and everything else that he's created in creation. And so God is using this rainbow now, this rainbow has multiple colors because the prism shows multiple colors. But it's kind of interesting. You go to Revelation, and John is looking at the throne of God, and he sees a bow all around the throne. Not just a half bow, but a, or, you know, just you know, one half of a bow. But a bow, and, and by the way, that bow is a different color. It's green. But then there's these um, reflections of light that comes from the throne that's all different colors. So, you know, but he, he, met, he sets this bow in the clouds and he says, this will be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Okay, not just Noah. This is for all generations. And it, and it shall come about that when I bring a cloud over the earth, the bow will be seen in a cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature and all the flesh, and never again shall water become, um, become a flood that destroys all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, then I will look upon it and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature and all the flesh of the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh on the earth. So again, the very key points. He, God is making a promise. And that's what a covenant is. It's a promise. It's a partnership. But in this partnership, God is making this partnership between him and all the earth. The earth doesn't have to do anything. The flood, all the flesh, the animals, the people, and everything else don't have to do anything specific that would break this. This is an established covenant. This is an established agreement that God is, that God is making with all of mankind, including all the animals of the earth. And he says, this is going to be it. I'm using something that I created because you've never seen rain before. But now when I send the clouds over and it begins to rain, I will see that bow. Now again, again, I love the word remember. How we've talked about remember yes, last week? When God, God remembered Noah, it's not like God forgot. It's not like God's forgetting his covenant and goes, oh yeah, that's that rainbow. I remember now. Again, that's not what that remember means. It's not a forgetfulness of God. You just have to remember that God's seeing this full picture. And as he sees that rainbow, that's just a constant reminder of a covenant that's leading to the salvation of all man. So is the rainbow the only covenant that has a picture image like that? Yes. Do you agree with that, Paul? Yes. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, I never thought about it that way, but yeah. Is there a... Is, is, what is, another covenant of God that has a picture in That it. has a symbol a of symbol. that covenant. Yep. I never thought about that one, but yeah, that's a true statement. You mean a sign of yeah. the covenant? Yeah. Well, that's the only sign like that I know, but other covenants also had a sign. Yeah, the only other covenant I could see is... Technically, having a sign would be uh, communion. It's the only other one 
that I can think of is at least something that when we see and or do, that it represents a covenant. Okay. But it's the only thing that has the God made sign. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because the, uh, the covenant with Jacob was just the, uh, that he'll make them a, a tribe of many people. Uh, so the 12 tribes of Israel giving him the, uh, and from that line will come the, uh, the Torah. And then I don't remember, I haven't actually reread the one with David, so I can't speak about that one much. Well, it's the, the symbolism of, of the covenant with, with um, David would be the, the Jesus. Right. On the line of David? Yeah. That's Jesus coming from the line of David? Right. Okay. But again, I mean, I, 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 I really hesitate on imageries because, again, there's a, there's a lot of Christian religions, that, Christian religions that use imageries that almost turns into idols. Mm -hmm. And Catholicism is one of them. All right. So before we go, before we leave verse seventeen, because we're gonna now what we're gonna do in the last half of this is now we're gonna begin to see. Okay, God's rescued the family. He's provided the covenant. He's provided the food and everything else. Is there any questions or anything that we want to discuss or anybody wants to else share what they've learned through this? So, uh, so I wonder at what point. Did humans begin eating fish? Probably at the same time. Because he says all living creatures. Well, it's strange how that the, a lot of the, I mean, the disciples were fishermen. Right. Mm hmm. Makes you wonder how they were fishing. fish. Was it? Where, nor does it really state in the Torah's annotations. It just says that after the, uh, after the flood is when God gave the commandment that we could eat the, uh, the animals of the land and the sea. Yep. Because again, there was no fear in any of the animals. And I would assume that would be true with any um, fish or animals that live within the water. Hey, Marty. Yeah.
Noah was a righteous man, but he was born sinful, just like we're born sinful. Everyone mm. after Adam and Eve was born sinful. So right. there was sin naturally in us. I don't know that it ever spells out exactly what his sin was or what he did to sin, but I do believe, just like everyone else, he was a sinful man, but he walked a righteous life. That's correct. And that, and, and, and again, it goes back to Romans three twenty three: all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so, as Paul writes to Romans. So I mean, once you know, um, and Paul and, and Paul gets into this really deep into Romans, and, and remember, for those that studied Romans. Because that sinfulness is carried out through one man. And the forgiveness of, uh, and, and, and the renewing of man has come out through another man. So through one man came sin, through another man came the salvation. Now one man started with, with Adam, the next man was Jesus. And so, yes, um, we're going to talk about what Noah does here is, is, and what Noah did himself. Is that a sin or not? We'll talk about that. But then we'll talk about what exactly did Ham and, and um, he do and what, and what his other brothers did in opposite of what Ham did. And we'll see why God, in a sense, gives um, Noah this prophetic words against not Ham, but actually against um, one of Ham's sons. So let's, anything, before we get into 18, anything else about 1 through 17? That anyone wants to share. All right, so starting because now we, you know, and I mentioned what's going to happen now is we're going to start turning down the microscope slowly into where it's going to eventually get down to after chapter eleven, starting with chapter twelve, the microscope's going to get down to Abraham. Okay, so again, see the picture. God knew. Before the foundation of the earth, that Jesus was going to come, that Jesus was going to die on the cross. And he also would, is, is written in the scripture that God knew us before the foundation of the earth. So think about this. You know, we're only, a, you know, as, as the psalmist writes, we're only just a piece of grass, a vapor. A vapor. And, you know, as in Ecclesiastes, you know, we're nothing in a sense compared to all of creation, but yet God still loves us so much, that little piece of grass, even the sparrows, as, as, um, as Jesus mentions in, in, in Matthew, even the sparrows, you know, God knows. He knows the hair on all of our heads, and some of us, that's maybe easy, and some of us may not be so easy, but you know, still, God knows all that, but still, don't point to Michael, I, I didn't point to Michael, but James oh, me. James too. <laughs> Oh, James put his hat on? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. Now, the sons of Noah came out of the ark, and there were Shem, Ham, and Jebeth. And Ham was the father of Cana, and, there was th and, and, and these three were the sons of Noah. And from, the, and from these, the whole earth was populated. And we're going to get into verse 10, and we're going to see how that population continues to grow. But, you know, so... Um, Noah, verse 20, Noah begins farming and planting a vineyard. So let me stop right there. Did Noah plant a vineyard before the, before the, um, before the flood? For all cattle. Yeah. That's what it, it, you had to do. That. Well, I yeah. guess they had to have a garden to eat. Yeah. So again, <laughs> cultivate. <laughs> what? Noah created farm tools, so I assume that he would have been some type of farmer. Yeah. The whole the command to Adam and Eve go and cultivate the earth, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. So farming was not new. This is not something brand new. Again, and the reason I'm pointing this out because there's a lot of mistruths that come out of a lot of things that they think that you know, well, no one never really knew what wine was, and never knew what the effects of wine would have, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh that's not true. That's nowhere in Scripture do you read that, you know. Noah comes out, and one of the first things he does is he, you know, we don't know if it's one of the first things he does, but one of the things that he does is he goes and he cultivates and grows and he begins to grow grapes. Mm -hmm. And so here he is, he plants a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk. Okay, before we get any further, okay? Is that a sin? Getting drunk. I don't think getting 
drunk is a sin, but I think getting drunk can lead you to sin. Your actions. Your actions yeah. while doing Not by itself. Okay. Everybody in agreement with that? That's true. That's a true statement. You know, drunkenness, let's put it this way. Everybody, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I, don't mis misunderstand me. I believe in the sanctity of life. But everybody jumps on the bandwagon for talking bad to women that have abortions. And, you know, and from Don and I, who our lives have been around nuclear power, power plants and everything else, there's a thing called root cause analysis. Abortion is not the problem. Abortion is a problem. But it's not the root of the problem. You know, and it goes all the way back to what Pastor Jordan's talking about, about the sexual immorality that goes on in people's lives. And how that sexual immorality, now again... Where did, Jordan, where did Jordan teach about um, adultery? Or maybe I'm missing, is it, was it Jordan or maybe I'm, it was in the Ten Commandments series? I'm sorry. But anyway, I was, um, we're also studying um, Pastor Robert Morris. uh, Morris's Ten Commandments with another small group. And so I may be getting these two mixed up. I'm getting old. Um, not as old as Paul, but I'm getting old. <laughs> um, but still, um, you know, you sit here, is, is getting drunk a sin? No. Not exactly, but we're going to watch what happens here. It What happens, and, and whether you call this sinful or not, not only does he get drunk, but he, lay, he he's uncovered himself inside his tent. Now you go, okay, Marty, that's not really a sin either. You know what I mean? You know, some people go to bed naked. You know, I'm not going to say it's a sin, but in that sinfulness, and I love how you say it, in, that, in, in him getting drunk led Two, and I'm not going to say what Noah did was simple, but what Noah did was a disgrace to himself right. that led to a bigger problem. But it started off with what Noah did. And by Noah getting drunk and being naked and laying himself and, and getting drunk where he ends up passing out and being naked, not to say that, hey, he's in his own tent. You know, can he be naked in his own tent? Yes. You know, but still, what happens is because of this Drunkenness. Now you have to ask the question: Why did Why did Noah? And again, I'm, you know, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that he did that he didn't know what wine does and everything else. But I'm going to make a safe assumption that he knew wine was wine and that you could get drunk off of wine. Mm -hmm. You know. So now the question is: Is why did Noah do this? Why did Noah get drunk in the first place? This is speculation. You're not going to find it in the Scripture. I want you to kind of think through this because sometimes just understanding how people react in Scripture helps us understand how we can not react the same way. It says in the Torah annotation that uh, Noah actually craved wine, and in verse 20, when it ended, or it comments that Noah debased himself and planted the vineyard, he debased himself because he craved wine so much that he planted the vineyard over other crops first. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be true. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with that. That's a Jewish perspective. What else? Why did Noah get might, might get drunk? Michael, James. Life sucked after the flood. Yeah. That could be it. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry, what James? Well, I say I said he was married. Kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We need to record. We need to take that one out of the recording. Michael said that. <laughs> uh, we're gonna leave that in there and blackmail him. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, here's my thoughts. There's nobody else around. You know, think about this. We've been living under the stay-at-home policy. And I don't, and the news is not reporting it, but I'm, so I'm not going to say it's happening, but I'm not going to say it's not happening, but President Trump, in his briefings in the past, says he wants to get back to America because pe because if people continue to live at home and don't work, you're gonna get, uh, people are going to get commit suicide. Now, you know, again, mm -hmm. I don't think the news media is picking up that. Is there's been suicides because of this? Probably so. But just think about it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a homebody. I like getting out. 
I mean, I could have done this like, you know, like James and, and, and Michael's doing, and I could have just ta taught over Zoom. But I've been teaching over Zoom, I've been leading meetings and holding meetings over teams and other uh, media things every, all day long. I got tired of it. I, I'm a, me, Marty Vance, I got to get a, I go to Lowe's just to get to Lowe's, just to walk around. All right. Yeah, I need to get things, but I, I don't like being around people. You know, so I'm thinking about Noah. You know, it's him, his wife, his sons and their wives, period, and animals that now have a fear of him instead of being friendly to him. And I'm thinking that, you know, in a sense, there's a sense of depression going on here. That's happening here. And Noah's planting a vineyard. Maybe it's because of what Kip said. Maybe it's because, like with the Jewish thought, that, hey, he, he, he put that over top of the other of, of, of things. It doesn't say that in Scripture. But still. Craves wine, but that depression could be a very plausible reason to why he craved it as an escape from the reality of nobody else really being there. Right. And, here's the, and here, to me, may be part of what you may consider sin is that we sometimes use drink to escape reality. You know? And so, you know, people use drugs, they'll use alcohol, they'll use their jobs, they'll use a lot of different things to, to escape from the reality of, of the situation they're involved in. And so in my mind, and again, I'm just, there's nothing in Scripture that's going to back this up. But why did Noah get drunk? And in my mind, I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking, what else? I mean, here he is. Everyone else has died. All of his family members that he knew. And these guys lived long times. You know, God, Noah was a righteous man, but as James also pointed out and went in answering um, Michael's question, he was not a sinless person. He was a righteous man. We're going to, when we get into Abraham, we're going to find out that Abraham is a father of faith. You know, I mean, he is. It, it could have been super simple. You know, he didn't know how long he was going to be on that boat. And he may have only packed enough alcohol for, you know, a few months. <laughs> he may have already had alcohol on the boat. That's true, too. You know, again, we don't know. We're, we're making speculation. But the, the, sure. here's the speculation I want to get across. Is that, and, and, and to find ourselves in the same situation, when you're faced with a difficult situation, what do you turn to? We're going to see Abraham later on. We'll see Abraham, and God's been blessing him and making covenants with him, and yet he still runs off to Egypt and lies about his wife. You know, it doesn't make him to be a perfect person. We're going to see David, another person that God makes a covenant with. David was not a perfect person by any shadow of a means. You know, but it has nothing to do. We're not perfect people. But God still loves us and God can still use us. And God used Noah. So let's keep continuing. What time is it? Ooh, we're, I, I want to get done. Okay. Um, so, you where know, Noah... Where will I start? Huh? Where will I start? We, so Noah drinks. He, he's, he's drunk. He uncovers himself in his tent. Now watch this. Ham, the father of Cana, and again, you have to keep in mind also, who's writing this? So who, who's God speaking through to write all what we're writing? Okay, so Moses is kind of like, you ever heard of the story 2020's hindsight? Or hindsight's 2020? Mm -hmm. You know, Moses is, is, God's inspiring him to write these things out. No, Moses wasn't there, but he's referring to Cana because he knows what, what the Israelites are going to be facing pretty soon when they go into the promised land. So there's a lot of emphasis at one point because of this. But so, you know, Ham, the father of Cana, sees the nakedness of his father and goes and tells his two brothers outside. But Sham and Japheth, they took a garment, they laid it um, upon their shoulders, and they walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away, so they did not see their father's nakedness. Okay, so let's stop there before we get into the, into the pronouncing of the curses. So Noah gets drunk. He's laying naked in his tent. Ham comes in, and he sees 
his father's nakedness. And he goes and he tells his brothers about it. Now, what's the big deal about that? The issue is that unlike uh, Shem and Japheth, instead of taking a garment and covering him, um, the root words of what's used in those sentences were that he leered and kind of laughed and found his father's state amusing rather than taking care of him in that state. That's right. There's the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word used in the, in, the, in the viewing has more to do with a sexual connotation than just a simple glance. And oh, hey, look, my dad's naked, and making a jest out of it. So the the actual Hebrew word is also used in other places in Scripture that refers to sexual immorality. So what Ham does, we don't know. I mean, he doesn't explicitly say what. And so again, there's a lot. Of, you read the commentaries there. And there's some that say, oh, it was homosexuality and a lot of other stuff. You know, we don't know that. I'm not going to go down that, that avenue. But what we do know is that Ham looked at his father. He made jest over it. You know, that jesting could have been more of a sexual connotation than anything else. And he, and in a sense, seeing his dad naked, he makes jest out of it and he, and he uses it to belittle his father to his brothers. And so his brothers, on the, on the flip side of that, they hear it, and they do the respectable thing, and so they put a, a, a piece of cloth over him, and they back up, not even looking at their father's nakedness, and they cover up his father's nakedness, and stuff like that. Ham doesn't do that. Now, you're going to get here, and we're going to see that, that um, Noah's going to curse Cana. And my wife and I was talking about it, she goes, well, why did he curse Ham? Why did he curse the... Um, you know, Cana, his son. And again, and it may be, you know, in the, in um, Jewish writings, stuff like that, but some, you know, some commentaries will go, well, it's because Cana was with his dad when they saw, um, when, they, when Cana saw his grandfather naked, he was with Ham when he walked in the tent. There's nothing in the scripture that says that. So again, there's, there's some things we just don't know why it happens, except we do know this. There's a prophetic statement being made here that God's giving to Noah about a curse to, to Ham's son. And you'll see, you know, as we get it, and we're not going to dive into it, trust me, we're not going to dive into chapter 10 and go verse by verse by verse. But I challenge you to go and read chapter 10 because it's a laying out of all the nations. Got some information on the curses, Canaan. What it, what it says in here is that uh, Ham sinned and Canaan cursed. But because God had already blessed Noah and his sons, and therefore a curse cannot be over or override a blessing that was given by God, he cursed his son instead, so the descendants. And ergo, kind of like uh, the sins of the father transgress and pass on to the son. So since he couldn't technically override God's blessing to Ham, he cursed Canaan, and also, if I'm not mistaken, Canaan technically uh, castrated Noah at a later time. Okay, I don't, that's not in scripture anywhere either. So again, I don't know about that part, but yeah, what you just said first makes a little bit of sense that God has already blessed the sons, and so instead, you know, instead of putting a curse on the actual son, he does it to one of his to one of his sons. But and that and, and that and that makes sense. That does. But then it also makes sense to realize that who's writing this. And it's a prophetic statement of what Canaan is going to represent. Now, Canaan is going to be destroyed. The country of Canaan is going to be destroyed by the Israelites eventually. And um, but the whole, you know, the servanthood that's going to happen out of Ham continues on today. Now, this is not, you know, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I'm trying to. I don't want to rush too much. But this is, you know, there's a lot of misteaching in this section here. There's a lot of, because, you know, when, we, when you start to look and you look at chapter 10 and where these people um, begin to migrate to, Ham's descendants end up going into Africa, end up going into lower parts of Egypt and stuff like that. And so there's this concept in people's mind that, hey, black people were supposed to be slaves. That's what it says here in Scripture. That is a false teaching. Okay, right now I'm going to say it flat out. There is nothing in Scripture that says, that's pointing to that direction, okay? But we're going to read on here. So when Noah woke up from his wine, 
and knew what his youngest son had done, had done to him, he said, Cursed be Cana, the servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed is the God of Shem, and yet Cana is to be his servant. Okay, now again, see this picture. Blessed be um, the God of Shem. Why is, you know, why, why does Shem not Japheth? And, and, and I'm going to give, give you the answer to this. It's because, again, like I keep pointing out, God's seen the full picture here. It's through Shem and that lineage that Christ comes. Okay, so that, that lineage begins now with Noah, and then the next line, the next one in the line, as we would, you know, talking about the lineage of things, the next one in the line after Noah is Shem. And if you go and you, and you study the um, lineage all the way up to Christ, Shem is a part of this, okay? When we, when we talk about um, Abraham and how God's not only going to bless his descendants, but he's going to bless the whole world because of the seed of Abraham. Who's that seed of Abraham? It's Christ. So, you know, again, blessed, um, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he, may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So before we go any further, I want to just kind of wrap this up real quick. God's seeing the full picture here. The propheticness, and this, and again, I don't, I don't want to lose the point on this, because is this the first time God makes a prophecy? No. Go back to Adam and Eve. You know, what was, you know, hey, there's going to be an enmity between your seed, the man's seed, and devil. The enmity is Christ. Okay? So God's seeing, you know, again, you have to look, when you read these things, you've got to try to look at it the way God's seeing things. God's seeing the full picture here. He's blessing Shem because he knows the God of, the, the God of Shem is going to be also the one that's going to be blessed through Shem's line is going to be Jesus Christ. So God's seeing the full picture here. And so he, and, and he's seeing, yes, and, and, I agree, and I'm not going to argue on, on what you're saying there, Ken, as far as God had blessed, um, you know, Ham, so instead of cursing Ham, he curses his son, but he only cursed Cana. He didn't curse the other sons of Ham. But you'll see, as we, as we continue to study, and as you look, read chapter 10 and get into, into chapter 11, you'll see how that seed of Ham continues to, that, that, that sinfulness continues to roll away in that whole family. And to where you have Nimrod, and you have the people now, all can speak one language, and they're starting to build this temple. And up to the sky, totally opposite of what God wants. And God says, hey, look, we got to disperse them. I'm going to confuse your language. And chapter 10 goes through and it will, and, and it will explain how each of these um, three sons and their descendants begin to spread out across the earth. But and you think, well, wait a minute. How they spread out when in chapter 11, it's a precursor. In other words, it's kind of like chapter 11 should be before 10, but chapter 10 is kind of going through the genealogy Chapter 11 kind of drops back and says, okay, here's the reason why they spread out. It's because of what's going to happen in chapter 11. All right. Marty? Yeah. I'd like to read something from my NIV Bible that's a, an interpretation, if I can use that expression, for verses 20 to 27. Okay. I think it summarizes what you're saying. This is what it reads. Noah the great hero of our faith, our faith, got drunk, a poor example for the godliness to his sons. Perhaps the story is included to show us that even godly people can sin and that their bad influence affects their families. Although the wicked people had all been killed, the possibility of evil exists in the heart of Noah and his family, Ham's mocking attitude revealed the severe lack of respect for his father, 
and from God. Now that kind of summarizes what you've been saying here. Yep. There are some things in here, when you first read them, they don't make any sense. But if you look at it from that perspective, that we thought Noah was sinless, he wasn't, he was righteous, he was perfectly capable of sinning, he did sin and set a bad example for his son. He had a son who obviously disrespected him and laughed at his father or whatever it was. But the reason I read that was to try to put that whole thing into a context so we could all understand it a little bit better. Right. All right? I appreciate so, that. I appreciate that because that's absolutely true. And when you go and you read through this, you're going to find out that even Japheth and his descendants will end up, his descendants actually are going to come back with Mad God coming back in, in Revelation and coming back and joining forces, you know, with Satan and to try to take over. So people are simple. What you, you said, I like how, what, is that in the NIV Bible, study Bible? You know, I, I, I mean, that's an excellent point. You know, think about this. Noah was a righteous man. His sons were part of that covenant agreement that God had made that he wouldn't destroy that family, including his sons. Ham just doesn't turn evil all of a sudden after the flood. That, that sense of evilness has probably already been built into Ham's life. You know, because he lived 100 years. I mean, Noah had Ham... And his sons, when Ham, when Noah was 500 years old, the flood happened when Noah was 600 years old. So it was 100 years of Ham even seeing how the world was just acting. You know, so the sinfulness that Ham, you know, inside of Ham didn't just all of a sudden appear. You know, it's probably, you know, yes, like what the NIV said, you know, his father's disgrace opened the door. Okay, I know who you are. Be quiet. Um, open, open the door. That's my ERO thing. Open the door for that sin to go in. Just like what God said to, to, to um, Cain. Hey, sin is crouching. Don't give in to it. You know, Paul writes, he says, hey, yeah, you can be angry. Just don't sin in your anger. You leave a foothold for Satan. You know, what Noah did was he opened, you know, in his disgracefulness, he opened a foothold for that sinfulness that was probably already rooted and began to happen in the hand's life for it to come out full-fledged. We can be righteous people, and yet it doesn't necessarily mean our sons and daughters will be righteous. But still, going back to what Jordan was teaching, it's our responsibility and I go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and, 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 and on. It says, as parents, we are supposed to talk to our kids when, we, when they rise up, when they go to bed, when we're walking down, when we're coming back home. You know, and I think we fail a lot of times because we don't do that. We talked we talk about, you know, I've said this before, we talked about missions and going here and going there and serving God in all these different places. But hey, your mission field happens first at home. Your relationship first with God, your relationship if you're married to your wife, and then between you and your wife, your relationship with your children. That's your first mission field. And so when Paul writes to Titus and when Paul writes to Timothy and gives them the guidelines of what an elder 